This reflection is based on the 29th Sunday of Year A in Ordinary Time. Imagine that you live in a country run by a dictator. Would you withhold paying your taxes? In America, we have a system of checks and balances that works to prevent the abuse of power. Our system consists of the legislative, judicial, and executive branches. These three should keep each other in check. Even with power divided among three branches, the citizens of our country often strongly disagree with those in power. This makes sense because if the country is currently divided in half, the odds are 50-50 that we will strongly disagree with the person in power. There are some parallels from our own political climate that can be seen in the politics of Jesus' day. In this Sunday's Gospel reading, we hear of the Pharisees, a Jewish sect who collude with the Herodians, a Jewish political party who are sympathetic to Roman rule. The Herodians were supporters of Herod, who was put in power by the Roman Emperor. Thus, they were closely affiliated with Rome. There were many differing Jewish sects during Jesus' Jesus's time, but the main conflict in Jerusalem was between God's chosen people, the Jews, and their tax-demanding rulers, the Roman Empire. Jewish nationalists resented this. To add injury to insult, Rome had a pagan slash state religion that considered the emperor as a god. As seen in the gospel, their currency even had the image of Caesar on it. In this light, Jews conceived paying taxes as an indirect attack on, uh, or betrayal of one's Jewish faith. After all, the first commandment stated that Thou shalt not make any graven image before me. While there were strong divisions between Rome supporters and Jewish nationalists, the Herodians and Pharisees collaborated with the same goal in mind, to entrap Jesus. They asked Jesus if it is lawful to pay the census tax to Caesar. They think that Jesus is stuck in a dilemma with only two possible answers. His first option, to promote paying Caesar's taxes and in the process alienate his own Jewish people. His second option, to deny Caesar his taxes and make enemies with the mighty Roman Empire. Jesus evades this trap. He presents a third choice. He figures out a way to reconcile the political and religious spheres. He shows how they can peacefully coexist and not always be at odds or at each other's throats. He responds, Repay to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. There is a hierarchical ordering implicit in his answer. The earthly city is always subjected to the heavenly city. Caesar's dominion is under God's dominion. In fact, the God who has permitted Caesar to be in power is also the same God who brought Caesar's ancestors into existence. This takes us to the first reading, when Isaiah prophesies about an event in the 500s BC, a pivotal point in Israel's history. This is a time when Persia had just taken over Babylon. Isaiah writes how God anointed Caesar. Caesar is the Persian emperor who restores the Israelites from exile in Babylon. God works through Caesar to fulfill his will. Caesar is God's instrument an instrument in the hand of God. Cyrus, I mean, sorry, Cyrus is God's instrument. Cyrus allows the Jews to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. In, the, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13, it tells us, Be subject to every human institution for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or to the governors as sent by him. These rulers wield great power because their actions have consequences that affect whole nations of peoples. That is why in Mass, we pray for those in power such as the President, the Supreme Court, and the Senators. In the Gospel, Jesus affirms we ought, that we ought to give God what is God's. 
Like how the coin bears Caesar's image, we are made in God's image. How so, you ask? We are created with intellect and free will. We are given the capacity to know and the agency to love. We are called to know and to love God. To give Him everything we have, we owe Him our very existence. God's Trinitarian image is also a reflection of us as seen when we live in communities, in families, in society, and as a church. The Catholic Church is not against paying taxes. In fact, it is, it is a sin not to pay taxes regardless of who is in power. We may disagree with how our tax dollars are spent. We may not even like the person who is in charge. But we still have an obligation to pay our taxes, to vote, and to engage in the political sphere. The Catholic Church is not a political party. The state and the church have distinct roles. Still, they are meant to complement each other. Since Mother Church deals with our souls and our eternal salvation, she takes priority over the state. The state's realm includes the responsibility of our physical needs. It is not the church's primary role to worry about taxes, public roads, police, and fighting wars. In the same way, it is not the state's primary role to interpret scripture. God's, God's laws ranks above the state's laws. Man-made laws should be based on the laws God embedded within creation or the natural law. As we know, man-made laws do not come out of thin air, but are based on the truth of reality. When law is not based on the truth, society is affected, as seen as how the Jews were treated during World War II. You know, our human, our rights to be human, to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that all are created equal in the eyes of God. Knowing this, how can we respond? In Genesis, we hear how all creation was good since it was created by God. That traces of the divine are in all creation. In the beginning, the universe was ordered and humans had a harmonious relationship with each other and with God. We who are created in God's image can act God-like when we help to restore order and harmony in society. We do this by first restoring the order within ourselves. After putting our own houses in order, we can go out and fight for certain causes in society. We should strive to bring all laws all nations and all creation back into right order and back into right relationship with God. If we do not base our society on God, then it will begin to lose its original sense of goodness. Goodness and order will give way to evil, confusion, disorder, such as things like genocide will, will occur. May we be agents of God's goodness and engage the political realm as soldiers of God's truth, love, and mercy. God bless.